arguments of the connection between proselytizing and spirit of capitalism. What he then goes on to do in that last chapter is indeed to look at the preachings, the doctrine, the sermons of Protestant ministers. Presbyterian minister Baxter in particular. Now Baxter is this English Presbyterian minister and he lives between, and very important, he lives between 1615 and 1691. Now why do I say that's important? Jason number two. Well, when was the Reformation? Yes. 17th century or the 16th century? Yes, so in the 16th century, so very good, Jason. It's late on. It is late on. Baxter's preachings are late on. We'll come to that in a second. But that is the writings that Weber refers to. Baxter's writings. And what does Baxter say on 157 to 159? Well, he's going to show, in fact, that there is already the spirit of capitalism in the Protestantism ethic. That there's a link, close link between the two, actually in the sermons. 157, 157, 157. Yeah. On page 157... 157, uh, if we look from the top of the page, 2, 4, 6, 8 lines from the top, he says examples, and he's referring, well, actually, perhaps we should really go down to the last paragraph on the page. Well, all right, doesn't matter. 6, uh, 2, 4, 6, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8 lines from the top. Examples that he's referring here to back, examples of the condemnation of the pursuit of money and goods may be gathered without end. Condemnation of the pursuit of money and goods may be gathered without end from Puritan writings and may be contrasted with the late medieval ethical literature which was much more open-minded on, the, on this point. The condemnation of the pursuit of money and goods. Yes. Yes. As something to be consumed. And then last the paragraph on that page. Waste of time is thus the first and in principle the deadliest of sins. No. Don't waste time. Okay, Neil, the span of human life is infinitely short and precious to make sure of one's own election. Loss of time through sociability, idle talk, luxury, even more sleep than is necessary for your health, and uh, Six to at most eight hours is worthy of absolute moral condemnation. How many hours do you sleep a night, Neil? Five. Five. Very good. Just under the wire. Very good. You may still be saved. Next paragraph. Accordingly, Baxter's principal work is dominated by the continually repeated, often almost passionate preaching of hard, continuous bodily or mental labor. And then later down, he's on and goes on about sexual asceticism. Yes. Mm. <laughs> the sexual asceticism of Puritanism differs only in degree, not in fundamental principle, from that of monasticism. Okay. And on account of the Puritan conception of marriage, its practical influence is for, for more far-reaching than that of the latter. For sexual intercourse is permitted even within marriage, only as the means will by God for the increase of his glory, according to the commandment, be fruitful and multiply. Bear that in mind. 159, he says four lines from the bottom. Even though wealthy shall not eat without working for, even though they do not need to labor to support their own needs, there is God's commandment which they, like the poor, must obey, dropping down three lines. And this calling is not, as it was for the Lutheran, a fate which he must submit and which he must make the best of, but God's commandment to the individual to work for the divine glory. Time wasting is a deadly sin. Condemnation of enjoyment of wealth, hard work, sexual asceticism. These are actually the principles that are enunciated in Baxter's sermons. And so, essentially, what Weber is saying is that religion, religion passes over into economic or into an economic orientation. We can see it in the sermons themselves. And so, for example, he talks on 170, again, about the restriction of consumption, spending for the glory of God. You reduce consumption, and you must only concern with the glory of God. And then he talks about the encouragement of accumulation already, also on page 170. And he talks about how the religious orientation favored the development of the rational bourgeois economic life. And I'll read to you on page 176. 176. 176. Yes, now we're back around to Wesley. Um, 176, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8 lines from the bottom. What the great religious epoch of the 17th century bequeathed to its utilitarian successor was, however, above all, an amazingly... No. <laughs> I've got the wrong quote on page 176. The new paragraph, second new paragraph on page 176. Matthew, why did you read it out to me? As Wesley. As Wesley here says, the full economic effect of those great religious movements, whose significance for economic development lay above all in their ascetic educa- educative influence, generally came only after the peak of the purely religious enthusiasm of the past. Then the intensity of the search for the kingdom of God commenced gradually to pass over into sober economic virtue. Then the intensity of the search for the kingdom of, kingdom of God commenced gradually to pass over into sober economic virtue. Go on. The religious roots died out slowly, giving way to utilitarian worldliness. Then, as Dowden puts it, as in Robinson Crusoe, the isolated economic man who carries on missionary activities on the side takes the place of the lonely spiritual search for the kingdom of heaven of Bunyan's pilgrim, hurrying through the marketplace of man. Oh, that's beautifully translated. Yes, so there is, that is the idea of the religious ethic passes over into this economic...
economic behavior. The spirit of capitalism emerges from the Protestant ethic. It, and Weber says he can actually see this in the sermons of Wesley, of Baxter, of these Presbyterians and Puritans. Yes. But now what is interesting, what happens if indeed religion passes over into economic activity, what happens as capitalism develops? What happens to religion? That's the question. What happens to religion? No, Grace. Uh, I've been practicing that over the break. Really? Yeah, every day. Very good. Yes, so religion, we might say, tends to wither away. Yes, tends to wither away. But what function does the remnants of religion, what functions does, the, does religion play vis-a-vis Capitalism. Capitalism grows, religion perhaps becomes weaker, but what function does this religion now play, according to Max Weber? In the beginning, it was the impetus for the development of capitalism. But now, what role does it play vis-a-vis capitalism once capitalism is established? Greg? Justification. Hmm? Justification. Justification. Have you got a page number? Anybody got a page number? Simeon? 178. 178. Hmm. Where on 178? Uh, you know, on the yep. From where? Now naturally? Now naturally. Whoa, that's a long... Well, what after the footnote 107? And on the other hand, it legalized the exploitation of the specific willingness to work in that it also interpreted the employer's business activity as a calling, justified making profit as a calling. It is obvious how powerful the exclusive search for the kingdom of God only through the fulfillment of duty in the calling and the strict asceticism which church discipline naturally imposed, especially on the propertyless classes, was bound to affect the productivity of labor in the capitalist sense of the word. So, yes. And then he goes on, the treatment of labor as a calling became a char- as characteristic of the modern worker as the corresponding attitude towards the acquisition of the businessman. It was a perception, so he's suggesting that there is this idea of labor as a calling fit very nicely with the idea of on the one hand you have a capitalist making profit, and on the other hand you have a worker destined to actually produce the profit. Yes. I would like to turn to you, that's, that's, that is one possible passage. I want to go earlier to 162. 162 is a more bluntly presented by Weber. 162 after, thir- after footnote 39 in that page, in the second new paragraph, 246. Why did you read it out, Simeon? Six line down into the second new paragraph after footnote 39. Okay. For if that Speak up, it's too important. For if that God, whose hand the church and sees in all the occurrences of life, shows one of his elect a chance of profit, he must do it with a purpose. So if there's a chance to make profit, you must do it with a purpose for the glorification of God. Go on. Hence the faithful Christian must follow the call by taking advantage of the opportunity. So we just take advantage of opportunities to make money, and that, of course, therefore, in a sense, justifies justifies the pursuit of profit. And on page 163, why don't you read uh, the, second, the first, second new paragraph, the emphasis. Uh, the emphasis on the aesthetic importance of a fixed calling provided an ethical justification. An ethical justification of the... Of the modern specialized division of labor. In a similar... What's happened to you? In a similar... In a similar way... Right, so so the religion then becomes the legitimation of, on the one hand, making profit, and on the other hand, the subjugation and subordination of workers. The worker is destined to be a worker, that's his or her calling, just as the capitalist calling is to make profit. So religion becomes the great justifier of what? Capitalism. Of what? Specifically in capitalism. <laughs> Exploitation. Yes. 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 So, so that's the point here. That's we're going to, this is a really crucial point. Is that, well, see, well, that stresses again in a minute, but in the beginning, religion is what propels the spirit of capitalism, which becomes the foundation stone of this new Western bourgeois rational capitalism. But then once capitalism, modern Western bourgeois, is established, religion tends to become, take up smaller space in people's lives, and, but insofar as it continues to have a function vis-a-vis capitalism, it is to justify, to justify capitalism. Yes. Now. You know, there is an interesting debate that I must... This book is being, you know, researched and studied and read by so, so many people. Um, and one of the interesting debates that you must think about, of course, is what? Is whether... Is whether... Is whether the Protestant ethic comes before capitalism or what? Or capitalism comes before the Protestant ethic? Uh-huh. Right? I mean, it could be. We know that there is this link between the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. There's a link. But which? What causes what? Does capitalism, does capitalism 
modern Western bourgeois capitalism cause the Protestant ethic, or is it as Weber says, the Protestant ethic causes capitalism? Ha ha, ha ha, yes. One, two. Yes, yes, the number one. Right, but the question is, which is it in this case? Now, Weber, as of course Weber is saying, here, you might say a crude, simple-minded Marxist will be up here. But they're not in this room, of course. Yes. But anyway, but the question is an empirically interesting question. So what is interesting is that, look, Baxter, Baxter, Baxter is writing in the, in the, in the 17th century, right? He's writing in the middle, he's writing in the middle of the 17th century. It's when capitalism has already begun. And so one might argue that in fact Baxter's preachings, his sermons, do indeed reflect the rise of capitalism. That in fact, because Baxter is relatively late after the Reformation, one might argue that the capitalism began, and by looking at it, right, we see the prosthetic in Baxter or Wesleyan. Yeah. So, if one wants to examine this carefully, what does one do? What would one do if one empirically wanted to examine this question of whether it's capitalism causing the Protestant ethic, or whether it's the Protestant ethic causing capitalism, what might one do? Neil. I guess you could historically examine the level of complexity within capitalism before the Reformation before. Like yes. Before. Yes, well, you want, to, you want to look at something historically over time. You want to look at something historically over time. And I think one would want to look at the actual at the actual sermons of the Puritan ministers over time. And actually there's a fellow called Robertson who's done this. And what he discovers is that over the century before Baxter, if you look at the Calvinist teachings, they become increasingly infused with capitalism. And Weber takes the latter end of those preachings. And so some people argue that in fact it is the rise of capitalism that reshapes the character of Protestantism rather than Protestantism shapes capitalism. But it is an ongoing debate and it is a debate that will never stop because you can never really identify when capitalism begins and when it doesn't begin. It's damn difficult historically. And of course it's different in different places. It's a very difficult, very difficult thing to prove one way or the other. Bless you. Any thoughts on this matter? Giuliani, you had your hand up. Well, very generally, is that satisfying? Maybe we can talk more about the flow of capitalism being the question I think in terms of the justification, right, so that the Protestant ethic or the spirit of capitalism developing after the fact is more the justification. Right. But the so considering that there were certain ideologies that changed the capitalist, the formation of capitalism, which was also part of the development. Right, the question is this a real arrow? Does in fact the Protestant ethic particular Calvinism really does it influence the development of this capitalism clearly I think even Weber would ac- accept that capitalism shapes the Protestant ethic but is it but was this really crucial it's a beautiful brilliant argument at all three levels but is it true well it's a theory course so we don't have to worry too much but it's a fascinating question actually and I say many people have tried to examine this question it makes in a sense intuitive, it makes intuitive sense that, that Calvinism should have had, once you hear that once you hear the argument you can see it makes sense. a brilliant argument I mean it's just totally out there I mean it's just a spectacular argument I mean that this predestination leads to who would have thought that predestination Calvinism leads to the development of capitalism it's so brilliant that it has to be true <laughs> But it may not be. Yes, Sim, um, Matthew. Um, speaking, isn't it really difficult to separate causation? Yeah, incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, Weber's always having both ways, but he's making a claim here that this process of the spirit camp was a necessary ingredient to capitalism before you've got this accumulation. So he is making a strong argument, actually, in this book. Even though the other factors are important, he's giving a lot of attention to that one spirit of capitalism. Yeah, the cause, these causes of historical argument are incredibly difficult to demonstrate, but they're fun to try and prove and disprove, and you learn a lot in the process. Simeon. Well, I appreciate that Matthew's bringing that up because, I mean, really to get into this, we would have to look at that, what other scholars say is the rise of capitalism, right? So we can't really accept Weber's premises and then um, see where he went wrong. Yes, I think that's very good. Very good. You're a real true scientist, Simeon. I'm very impressed and delighted to hear you say that. Yes, you should compare different theories and which, which turn out to be truer than the others. Rather than saying something is true in the absolute sense, you have to compare, for example, with Marx's analysis of the origins of capitalism. He has many stories in different parts of... Uh, hmm? I wasn't being Marxism known for his origin of capitalism, but there are some scholars who argue about this today. Sure, sure. Endless arguments. The oracle on this matter is, uh, is Mike Levy, and he is the oracle of the origins of capitalism. Right? No? You're not the oracle? Okay. <laughs> you better be soon. Write your dissertation on it, so... Okay, very good, very good, very good.